begin is to stage, begin is to stage. Hello Rusty Quill fans, my name is Tom Crowley, I'm a writer, an actor and a comedian and I'm here to talk to you about Cry Havoc Ask Questions later, specifically about being an actor in several episodes of that show but you probably already also know that I wrote two of them as well, episodes 10 and 12 uh, he said, hastily checking his memory banks for the exact numbers but yes, as I say, I also, the keen-eared among you may have heard me in the background of several episodes playing some supporting roles, several of them in fact. Uh, in full, I think this is comprehensive, I played Naso, the senator, Mascus, the up-himself actor, who's a bit of a preening figure, uh, often complaining about the business, uh, which of course required a, a real... Uh, delving deep into my emotion memory because I can't relate to the sort of uh, bitter person who constantly complains about the entertainment business. That, that was a real reach for me. I also played uh, a ticket attendant at one point and uh, a fisherman as well. Hello, my name is Lori Ann Davis and I played La Villa, the reporter, Bacilla, the actor, and Valeria, the widow of a senator who enjoys interesting parties. Hi, my name's Ryan Hopevier Anderson. I'm the voice of Sexist Pompey, a couple of Roman messengers, a man on a horse, and a heavily breathing man in the orgy scene in Cry Havoc Ask Questions Later. Hello, everyone. My name is Corinne Cromfley, and I play Silo the Senator and the Tavern Keeper. If I had to pick a favourite, it would have to be the um, one line ticket attendant. No, I'm joking. It's hard to pick. I think Naso and Mascus are fun because as supporting characters, you have a contribution to make to the storyline, but who aren't characters that are heard constantly throughout every episode. You can take a bit more of an extreme choice with them. So this sort of brings me on to what it's like playing multiple characters and how to approach that. Generally speaking, if I'm playing a main character in a show, what I'll tend to do is keep their vocal register reasonably close to my own. Sometimes, I'm trying to do this more and more, but, but sometimes I, I push them to a greater extreme just to sort of experiment with playing different kinds of characters. But broadly speaking, to make it easy to continuously capture those voices and to keep them consistent throughout a longer story or a series, I'll keep them fairly close to my own timbre that you're hearing right now. So uh, Eric Chapman generally is uh, slightly posher and more uh, consistently well-spoken than me and a bit more confident. Inspector Archibald Fleet is like me, but a lot more tired and a bit angrier. So it's more about taking a different attitude than it is about warping or contorting my voice to any particular extreme. However, if you have these slightly more occasional characters, uh, a good thing to do if you're playing more than one character in, in a long-running show is to just create as much variety between them as possible. In this case, Mask is just a bit more reedy like that, up in the voice, and just slightly camp and a bit preening, that sort of attitude. And Naso, an older senator, a bit more bluff, maybe a bit sweatier, a bit sleazier like that, so deeper, older, a bit creakier in the voice, and uh, a bit, bit lower in the, in the register, and uh, almost a slightly rolling quality to him, so he's slightly ambling into the room. Whereas Mascus is a lot more, um, he's a bit more flitty, and he's a bit more precise and sharp, because he's a bit more um, sarcastic, I suppose. So those, I think, are the way I would separate those two. Now, ticket attendant and fisherman, you find yourself having to plumb the depths of slightly more accents, uh, or even finding uh, even more extreme weird contortions you could put on your voice so that you could change things up a bit more so if you've got five six seven characters to play uh, you could start finding even more extreme characters or voices to do just to differentiate each character my favorite of the three characters i actually think it was la villa the reporter and i think she's in episode two or three and I think she was my favourite just because as soon as I read the lines, I was like, oh, I know who this woman is. I know exactly who this is. This is someone fabulous trying to get the attention of famous people on a red carpet. And I just felt like, yeah, I get it. So I really, really enjoyed playing La Villa very, very much indeed. Favourite character that I played was probably Sexist Pompey as he's just this, you know swaggering, no-nonsense, intimidating king of the pirates. But he's, he's also got quite a sensitive side to him, and I think at his core, you know, he's, he's, he's a good soul. Just 
enjoys partaking in the occasional bit of murder and pillaging, as all pirates do. Did you have a favourite of the characters you played and why? Well, I mean, they're both fairly simple characters, to be honest. Um, Silo, I suspect, is the, my favourite because he was quite a pompous arse of a senator, I suppose. <laughs> Always fun playing that kind of character. The Tavern Keeper, of course, we had a sort of feeling he might be the eternal Tavern Keeper, given chapter and multiverse and all that kind of thing, but uh, it was decided against that in the end. But I think some of the fans took the idea that me playing another Tavern Keeper was a fun idea. Anything I particularly loved or hated about my characters? I think La Villa, I will echo what I said about her being my favourite character play, just in that I read it and was like, I know what to do with this immediately. The Scylla. I actually had a lot of trouble with the Scylla. I think I didn't want to, like, play a stereotypical darling, darling actor. And I actually think that was an instinct that maybe I shouldn't have followed. Because I did struggle to find her a bit. So maybe... I don't know. It's not that I loved or hated it about her in particular. I just... So yeah, I just struggled to to find her. I'm laughing at myself. That's such a darling thing to say, isn't it? And maybe that's why I didn't want to lean into that because I was afraid it would reveal too much about me. Oh my gosh, we're getting too deep. Uh, and then who was my other one? Oh, Valeria. I mean, she's just great, isn't she? She's just having a great time. She may not be the best of people because she sounds very, very privileged. Which doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person, but I don't know how much questioning of that or self-reflection about that Valeria has done. Yes, she does like to have fun, though, in my mind, and I enjoyed that very, very much indeed. I did love that before we meet him, Sextus had this whole infamy and horror of dread around him. I mean, he's literally called the Dread Pirate. But being able to then bring out that thoughtful and almost paternal side to him after he meets Octavia and Antalus, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun to play with. One challenge about recording a show like Cry Havoc Ask Questions Later, which was all recorded, it was out of order, it wasn't chronological in order of the series, and also it was scattered, so I'd be called in two days one week, nothing the next week, one day the following week, so keeping track of all these characters was quite tough, and uh, I think I did an okay job, but one thing I did notice is that to uh, make me a little more different from some of my other characters, uh, for the fisherman, I, I believe, shh, 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 uh, listen closely back to that episode if you, if you haven't spotted this but I think you can tell that it's me but artificially pitched down I don't know maybe they thought that I wasn't uh, rough and tough enough to be a working fisherman and they thought they needed to make me sound a lot deeper more gravelly but anyway whatever the thinking that's what happened there any challenges recording multiple characters I personally worried about making them sound distinct from each other I don't think think any of them are in the same episode as each other so that definitely helps. I'm not particularly great at accents. The ones I can do, you know, just like an English one, we've got a lot of those so you don't really need me to be pretending I'm English. So, you know, I'm very happy to be populating various worlds with Welsh accented people but then of course you have to differentiate between them with... Um, tone and uh, depth or placement in the mouth, throat, nose, whatever. La Villa we recorded in one go, I think. So that's really easy, right? Because you just have to find the character, bang, done. Valeria we did over a couple of recording sessions, though they were quite close together, if I am remembering correctly. I have not checked this. So, you know, you just have to remember between a couple of days, oh, what was the voice I did? And then kind of key into that. Basilla, on the other hand, because she appeared in episodes towards the beginning, middle and end of the show, like, just remembering, oh, what did I do for her? And I mean, there might be a reason that she is the closest to my voice, because I was like, right, I'm going to think ahead on this. She's the one who, you know, I'm going to be playing over a longer period of time. I want to be able to maintain this. <laughs> Uh, cheating or wise? I'm going to go for just a very wise choice, actually. So I think those are the challenges and how I tried to get around them. Hopefully I was successful. 
there weren't really any major challenges recording multiple characters. I think it's it's always just that little extra bit of fun, getting to play about with different accents and scenarios, and you know, there's so many different locations and environments and things going on in Cry Havoc that, that it's quite easy to conjure up your own take on a new character. So the next question is, snog, marry, kill my characters. I think that's fairly easy. So... Ticket attendance not even going to feature into this ranking because, as I recall, ticket attendance very pedantic, not very forgiving, won't let Charmian into the theatre, even though it's her cue coming up soon. So I don't, I don't like him. He's, he's just out of the equation entirely. So that's, that's a neutral. Ticket attendant gets no opinion. Naso, uh, I'm going to kill because he's a little older. He's had more time on this earth anyway. So I, I don't think he can you know, claim to deserve to live more than the other two characters we're talking about. I'm going to snog Maskis, the actor, because I think he'd, he'd be a jolly good giggle for an evening, but I don't think he's, he's got the kind of commitment or the, uh, or the income for a married relationship. I'm going to marry the fisherman because, as I say, very masculine, deep and, and burly as well. Uh, also a person with a trade, a man who knows how to catch fish. Marry a man with one fish and you'll eat for a night marry a man who knows how to catch fish and you'll eat fish every day of your life and whether that's a good or bad thing depends on whether you like fish very important question snog marry kill my characters right i've got this immediately snog la villa kill basilla i don't know why maybe it's because i struggle to play her so much (laughs) maybe it is because i struggle to connect with her and then marry Valeria. You have to marry Valeria. She is absolutely loaded and knows how to have a good time. And I'm not saying that those are the most important qualities in a person at all. But I will encourage you to think about La Villa, Basilla and Valeria. And not that I'm saying they're bad people, but none of them had qualities that I was like, oh, wow, what a lovely person. What, a, what an attractive enticing prospect it would be to spend my life with you at least valeria can keep you right and you know that she's into very open and free love so you're not stuck with her in that way either look it just makes sense to me okay judge me if you will snog marry or kill um (laughs) i think i probably have to marry the the tavern keeper because he's obviously got a very good business there uh yeah being a tavern keeper in rome what could possibly go wrong you know and if the ravening hordes come over and invade then you can still offer him a beer to drink afterwards so uh, yeah well i'll probably uh have him killed quite happily (laughs) snog marry kill your characters i reckon i'd probably snog sexist because he's well he's not really marriage material but he is sexy I would marry the man on the horse because then we'd have a wee horse to share together and if I remember correctly that horse's name would be Nelly which is very sweet and I would kill the messenger from the house of Lucius Aeneas because he risked spreading the plague to all of Rome didn't even realise that's what he was doing and that was a bit silly of him so yeah, the messenger can die (laughs) Ooh, do I watch or listen back to my work? I have, over the years, grown immune to it because I edit a lot of what I am in. Something I find very interesting, actually, is if I'm editing myself in, like, an improvised or, uh, like, a chat showy kind of context where there's no script... I have no problem at all. Like, I don't even blink an eye. There's no cringe. There's no shadow of a cringe anymore. I can just get on with it and get it done. And actually, often I find I'm very consistent in my humor and laugh at my own jokes, which I don't know what that says about me. But yeah, I'm going to stick with my initial analysis of consistent. On the other hand, I have found while editing the scripted work, I find that very difficult that's when I start judging myself and I'm like oh I just I just want to take that again I want to have another go at that I don't think I don't think I got across what I was intending to get across yeah I think it is becoming easier because I have done a fair amount of it for Cry Havoc now and hopefully it will just continue to get easier because it seems that I'm doing that quite a lot these days which is very lovely no complaints but yeah, something I find quite interesting. Maybe someone up there can identify with that as well. 
Some people really hate to listen back to themselves after they've recorded a part. I know lots of people like that. I think it's completely valid. Now, for me, I don't have much choice in the matter a lot of the time because I make a sketch comedy podcast where I play all or most of the characters, depending on the episode, whether I've got a guest or not. So I have to listen to myself a lot for hours on end. So I'm basically inured to it at this point. So I've, I've lost any possible sensitivity I might have had about that. And I think that's the case for a lot of people who generate their own work, whether it's a YouTube creator or podcast maker, whatever filmmaker. I think a lot of people have to get used to that. So I don't mind at all. And also I... I never really minded it as much as some people seem to. And it's not that I adore the sound of my own voice or think that I'm, I'm basically flawless. If anything, I find it more that it's like revisiting fond memories. Like if I've recorded a drama with people that I've really enjoyed working with, it's lovely to listen back and just remember being in that recording studio or even just being at home, being on a, on a video call with whoever it might be. And uh, similarly, if it's just an improvised thing, a chatty podcast interview or whatever uh, I have no problem at all I'll usually listen back at least once to things that I've done uh, of course partly that's just to make sure that I haven't said anything that's like woefully inaccurate or potentially libelous that I need to ask them to take out but it's also because it is like for example I've appeared quite a few times on a, a great podcast about movies called Smirsh Pod with John Rain I've also appeared uh, alongside John and Tom Neenan, another fantastic comedian and writer, uh, on Smirsh Pod as well. And I love listening back to those quite often, because that really is like, if you're the person in the Funny Chatty podcast, it's like getting to revisit a bunch of fun conversations you've had with your friends, which is, um, I don't know, maybe that's a, a weird thing to do. Maybe that's weird. Maybe I'm weird, but that's how I feel. Do I like to watch or listen back to my work? Um, depends... I think for something like this, it's amazing hearing it all pieced together with all the other voices and special effects put on afterwards. But I can't help but cringe a wee bit when I'm listening back to my own voice. Um, similarly, when it comes to music, I do enjoy hearing it all back when it's a piece of work that we've made together as an ensemble and as a band. But when it comes to isolating the individual tracks and I can hear my instrument on its own, I'm, I'm like, I could have done that better or could have played that bit there tighter but you know that's not necessarily a bad way to be do i like to watch or listen back to my work yes i do it's part of me being uh, me always working to improve what i do but also as an actor i like doing feeling the emotions of what i do and and if i do a particularly good, good piece of work it's not unheard of for me to do a bit of guilty pleasure and listening back to the whole show again there are some shows that I've been in that I've listened to many, many times, not just for my performance. That would sound a little, you know, is self-sycophantic thing? I don't know. <laughs> Self-obsessed? No. Anyway, it's, I just love being in a really good show and, and being part of it is always fun. So, yes, I do listen back to my work. Uh, and, uh, of course, I have to listen back to it occasionally when I'm asked to replay a character uh, sometime after I did the first show, for example. So I have to listen back just to get the feel of who is playing again. Now, if you'd like to hear more from me and more of the things that I've done, the first thing I would send you to every time, all the time, would be Crowley Time, my sketch and character comedy podcast. It is my favourite thing to do. It's my favourite thing I've ever made and released into this world. It is now a kind of epic sketch and character comedy odyssey. It's got an internal world all of its own that I love delving into every time I make a new episode. It's had a bunch of different uh, brilliant guest stars lately. I've had Rufus Hound and Mike Wozniak and people like that off of the television. Loads and loads of different people who I, I've loved working with. Uh, and there's also other mini-series and things like Faces of Virtue, an improvised series that I've made with people like Gemma Arrowsmith and Susan Harrison, fantastic, brilliant improvisers and comedians. But the main bulk of it is a labour of love that has lasted Gosh, I think it's nearly five years at this point. But yeah, a, a huge number of hours and hours and hours of free sketch and character comedy uh, and also odder things that don't necessarily fit into those categories, which I class as messages in bottles plucked from unknown shores. That's pretentious, isn't it? But it's the closest I've come to accurately describing it. Uh, there's also a bunch of other shows I'll particularly give shout outs to Wooden Overcoats that I'm in a lot and if you like anything that Rusty Quills put out especially Cry Havoc you'll love Wooden Overcoats created by Cry Havoc creator David K. Barnes so listen to that listen to Victoriosity created by genius writers Chris and Jen Sugden a alternative past it's a bit like steampunk but don't call it steampunk because they hate it being called steampunk because it isn't steampunk but it's a Victorian London alternate past science fictional pseudo historical well it's not historical at all 
fun, thrilling, funny show with an incredible, huge cast, beautiful production values and just very, very funny, clever world building. If you like uh, Douglas Adams, uh, like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or Terry Pratchett, anything like that, you're going to adore Victoriosity. Uh, I'll also give a shout out to um, Ramon Fia's Terror Tapes, made by a bunch of people I know and love. Uh, And that is an anthology comedy horror show that I've appeared in a couple of times at this point. If you like your comedy a bit dark and, and uh, a bit uh, weird and creepy and strange, then Ramon Fears Terror Tape is a great new comedy horror anthology podcast that you must check out. Where else can people find your work? Well, you can find a lot of it on the Rusty Quill feeds. I'm in the show Chapter Multiverse. That was amazing. Try Forgotten, Cry Havoc. I will be coming up in Magda's Protocol. That's very exciting. And I am in other places over the internet. Uh, You know, in Wales, Lowry is quite a common name. But still, if you Google my name, things come up. I actually, as I said that, I was like, oh my gosh, do I want to encourage people to Google my name? What would you find? I might have to just go and run and Google my name to see what is out there. And maybe uh, edit some stuff. Hmm. Where else can people find my work? Well, if you're subscribed to Rusty Quill, you'll be able to hear me in another podcast, The Magnus Protocol, which is currently being recorded and set for release in 2024. And you can see and hear me performing with my band Tiberius. If you look up Tiberius UK on YouTube, Instagram, all the socials and all the streaming platforms. Where else can people find my work? Uh, Where else can't they find my work, I suppose? In the realm of indie audio drama, yes, I play a fair bit in Rusty Quill. Infamously Simon Fairchild and the Magnus Archives. Lots of stuff for Rusty Quill, but to be honest, I've done over 400 episodes of audio drama now, so I'm out there quite a bit. If you want to find me specifically, there's a website called podchaser.com, and I have a creator profile on there that lists everything I'm in. I have selected highlights on my website, which is dramaticvoice.co.uk. And uh, just Google me. It's not hard. (laughs) There's only two Korean Cromfleys in the world. And one's my cousin who is an ex-US Air Force, so he's not going to be into audio drama much. And the last thing that the people at Rusty Quill are demanding of me is a pitch for a spin-off series centred around one or all of my characters. So, um sidestepping the obvious one which would be naso mascus ticket attendant and fisherman run off together and solve crimes globally what could we have i think that we should have um, mascus the actor yes because he's he's very fun to play because he's just so cutting and he hasn't really got that much time for anyone else and i think he would realize that his career as an actor in rome is a failure and he would decide to make a lateral move into being an agent representing Roman actors. So you'd have a kind of a high-flying, cigar-chomping Roman talent agent who says things like, you know, there wouldn't be phone calls, you know, in in the 50s, 60s, that that character would obviously be making high-pressure phone calls, like, he doesn't get out of bed for less than $100. And uh, $100, easy booking. Uh, he doesn't get out of bed for less than a million dollars, that kind of thing. So in this, it would be more like he's he's talking to you know some sort of scribe, somebody who's taking down his dictation for him, and uh, he'd be saying, L- "Listen, you you write on that piece of tablet, and you run over to Quaternius or whoever it is, and and you tell Quaternius that my client doesn't get out of bed for less than a thousand sesterce." Or whatever it might be, that kind of thing. So I think that's it. Mascus, uh, the talent agent, Roman knights, something like that. Uh, The suns, the sunset Palatine Hill, or I don't know, something show busy like that, starring Mascus, the actor, having switched to behind the scenes talent management role, generally being catty to people, really tearing strips off them, and having all kinds of exciting adventures in the world of. Roman entertainment. I think that'd be great fun, and I'm going to go uh, pitch that to David K. Barnes for his follow-up series straight away. I hope that anything I've said has made any sense or been of interest or any help to any budding actors out there. If you do want to ask me any questions or if you want to keep up with what I'm doing, follow me at a Tom Crowley, Atom Crowley, on your your Twitter, your Instagram, basically any social media platform that exists. I am a Tom Crowley on those. So please check it out look me up and I'll see you there. Meanwhile, I hope you're enjoying Cry Havoc Ask Questions Later. I hope you continue to enjoy Cry Havoc Ask Questions Later. And if you are enjoying it, tell your friends, spread the word because it's a great show. And I, for one, would love to see more happen sometime. And it won't happen unless people are excited about it. So if you're enjoying it, spread the word, get it out there. And most importantly, be good to yourself.
See you around. Pitch for a spin-off series centered around one or all of my characters. Well, there has to be another series set in a bar. In ancient Rome would be very cool. There must be some kind of Latin play on the word cheers or something similar. No, you know, cease and desist letters, please. Must be a good thing there. I mean, I, I loved uh, Axe and Crown from the um, Alba Salix podcast feed, which is a sort of fantasy pub, and I played in one episode of that. And so, yes, I think, I think there has to be a spin-off in the bar, in the tavern, because <laughs> I'm sure lots of interesting stuff happens in a Roman tavern. There you go. Take care, everyone, and enjoy the show. My pitch for a spin-off series centred around one of or all of my characters. Hmm. Right, so I've got a journalist, a fabulously wealthy socialite, and an actor. I feel like there is some kind of docu-reality TV show here. Maybe... Oh, maybe like Bacilla is from a poor background I don't think we've actually had that explicitly said yet Uh, I don't think it's a massive spoiler she's an actor (laughs) Um, (laughs) I wonder if it could be some kind of Bacilla is trying to infiltrate or pose as a wealthy person in like the higher echelons of Roman society and La Villa maybe is our host of the show so you know kind of like the Davina McCall of Big Brother like she talks to the audience and she you know gives a lot of commentary and things like that and I think Valeria I think Valeria is the kind of person who would be so in on that and potentially was even her idea and she is funding it and she thinks it's hilarious to try and pass this actor off as one of their social circle. I'm now thinking, is it my fair lady? It's a little bit my fair lady. Is it a musical? I think it's a musical. Right, I'm going to go and Google my name and also send a quick message to Alex to tell him I have yet another idea for a musical podcast. Thank you, bye! Backstage at Cry Havoc is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, 4.0 international license. It is directed by Armani Zardo, produced by Laurie Ann Davis, with executive producers Alexander J. Newell and April Sumner. This episode is edited by Laurie Ann Davis and Meg McCallum. Thanks for listening. <laughs>